was a, an actor, a brilliant actor, I might say, John Hurt, portraying the life of Clinton Crisp, and this is Clinton Crisp uh, as he is today. How many years after that, that charge? The charge was brought against me in 1943, I think. And uh, not only because of that speech, but because of, of uh, testimony by your friends and people who knew you're, that you yes. were not, uh, you were found innocent. Of, yes. The charge was thrown out of court. Yes. Although not many years, well, yeah, many years before that, 14 years before that, you had in fact been a male prostitute. Yes, and, indeed. And you say in your book, and the film makes very clear, that that is the time when you found out, I think your words are, there are others like me. Yes. How did that come about? Well, of course, in those days, uh, many people denied that homosexuality existed at all. And I certainly never saw anyone who confessed to being homosexual or even heard about them in my own life. So I only saw the boys in the middle of London who were also made up and looked effeminate. And therefore I assumed that all homosexuals were like myself, which of course I now know not to be so. Like yourself in what way? That they were all effeminate uh -huh. and that they all lived in this sort of dream world in which they were made up and bejeweled and lived this exotic life either in fact or in their hearts. The film portrays very movingly the, that, that effeminate, public effeminacy that, that you displayed. I, I must find it to say I find it much lessened from the film now. Is that because the film was a caricature or you mellowed? Oh yes, I couldn't carry on in quite the same way now. I think it would be unsuitable. Why? Because of my age. I mean, when you're young, you can wear as much makeup as you like. And what you can't wear, you can carry. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't be suitable now. I must try and be a more moderate person. And it portrays that effeminacy, but it also makes it very clear that you had no desire to be a woman. You were not. Well, I suppose when I was very, when I was a child, when I lived almost entirely in a dream world, I suppose I thought of myself as a woman. But later on, you realize you have to live in the real world and that you are not a woman. You are only, in some senses, effeminate or feminine. And that you must make this compromise. You must learn to live in a world where, statistically, you are a man, whatever you may think about yourself. If you did not want to become a woman, what did you want to become? I didn't want to become anything. Once I accepted the world, all I wanted was that the world should understand what kind of person I was, so that there would be no misunderstanding, so that I would never be offered friendship or hospitality or even employment on anything that could be called a misunderstanding. Deliberately laid it out as far as I laid it out so that everyone would know what they were getting. What about the public, the, the so-called normal person who would pass you on the street? You write about that. And, and yes, they were extremely hostile. And I think it's because they saw that my difference from the rest of the world was sexual. And in England, sex is not popular. <laughs> Sex of either of any kind? Uh... Not of any kind. No display of sex, no talk about sex was popular until the permissive society began. People kept suggesting that you would go to, for example, Paris or uh, uh, some continental. I did not read any references about coming to Toronto during the 1930s when this was going on. But, but you said, no, you're going to stay home and do this in, in London. Oh, yes. There's no good doing it in Paris if if it causes no stir, then it covers no ground. You wanted to cover as much stir as you, to, to create as much stir as you could. I wanted to survive the stir. The idea was not to create it, but to outlive it. To show that people like me had to go on living, that they had to take their laundry to the laundry, they had to eat their meals in restaurants, they had to go to work, they had to come back. This is what people had to learn. And that was your crusade. In a kind of a way, yes. You say you threw off some of the 
I can't quote you precisely by heart, threw out some of the sorrow of, of homosexuality by turning it into a crusade. Yes, this is true. It made me less alone to feel that I was united with other homosexuals in this respect. One of the so, segments of society from which you were very strongly excluded was the, so, the I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but gay society as it was then recognized, the underground it did people worry. who looked straight. Yes, it worried the people who had anything to lose. It didn't worry the other boys in the West End. They were as badly off as I was. But the middle classes who felt if it all gets talked about, if everyone can take into that consideration that somebody is homosexual, we shall all be under suspicion. And this is what they didn't want. In the movie you were, in the film, you were thrown out of a gay club. This often happened because they feared they were drinking clubs and they feared to lose their license. What do you feel now about the gay liberation movement when people come out not in the way that you did, but publicly announce their homosexuality, whether, whether or not they signal it with makeup and dyed hair and so on? Oh, I think it's all a good thing because the more that people get used to the idea that homosexuals are among them, that they are here, the better, because the great weapon is boredom. Once the public gets bored with homosexuality, then uh, freedom will be here. How does the gay, move, gay liberation movement look on you as, as a patron saint or as a man ahead of his time? Well, they worry because they keep on thinking that I was once militant and that I am no longer so. This, of course, is not true. In the film, in any part of the film that you see, you see someone totally uh, acquiescent. You see someone who throughout the movie says very well, whatever you like, whatever you say. And this is the way that I've lived. I mean, I was so totally acquiescent that I've sat on buses and people have moved away from me. And I've said, if you like, I will get out at the next stop. But you must learn that even people like me cannot walk everywhere. You can't be more acquiescent than that. But acquiescence and your determination to flaunt yourself publicly in every way don't seem quite to jive. You know what I mean? I wanted to be recognized for what I was. And I wanted people to understand that though I said I was different, I didn't say I was better. In fact, you say in the book, that you look on heterosexuals as superior. Oh, yes, because they rule the world. <laughs> so you don't wish you were a heterosexual, or do you? I don't think it's possible to answer that question. It's like asking me if I would like to be dead. I have no idea what it would be like. Do you think you were a person just way ahead of his time, or in the wrong geographical place, or what caused Not the really. sensation that you became? Oh, I think the sensation was caused, oh, which would not be caused now, and it was caused in London and would not be, perhaps be caused in Paris, as you're saying. But I think that somebody had to make a statement of some kind so that ultimately other people could make a further statement.